Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vassell, and today I'm talking about the differences between the new 7th Citadel and 7th Continent. Now this is the smaller version of 7th Continent, that's the version I have, but they basically are the same size, so size is not a difference. Me and, Mel, uh, me and Ruby and Violet uh, reviewed the game 7th Continent, so you can go take a look at that. I like it, I think it's an enjoyable game, I think it has some issues to it. But I want to talk a little bit here because you might have played 7th Continent, you may or may not like 7th Continent, and you might be wondering what the differences are in the 7th Citadel. So I thought I would talk about those a little bit. So the biggest difference, or I think one of the biggest differences, is story itself. In 7th Continent, you land on an island, or you land on a continent, sorry, and you are stuck there and you're like, where are we? What's going on? And you walk through and it's sort of mundane, except it's like, ooh, there's things in the background. And I think that the stuff in the background, and that's interesting, it's kind of spooky, there's a little bit of fantasy. Seventh Citadel does not do that. The Seventh Citadel builds this huge fantasy world with worms burrowing under the earth, uh, necro-druids building plants to fight against them. It's just fantasy overboard. So if you like that fantasy and you want that forefront, and it's not generic fantasy by any means. It's definitely a, a, a whole world. In fact, there's a dialogue book, which I'll talk more about in a second. And at the front of the dialogue book is a glossary. And this glossary is there in case I forget what the purveyors are. They're a mysterious group that engage in various dubious activities, including supplying the citadels with slave gardeners during the War of the Worms. For dozens of cycles, Kel has turned a blind eye... To the kidnappings and other abuses the purveyors have committed to achieve their ends, what has happened to them since the reversal is unknown. What's the reversal? Then I read another paragraph. So there's a lot of different things in here. And so this book itself is full of stories and interactions that you have with people. Whenever you talk to people, you're going to probably end up reading in here. And this adds a ton of story to the game. I would say the story part of Seventh Citadel is probably 20 times greater than Seventh Continent. Don't get me wrong, there's still story in Seventh Continent, there's still stuff going on, but this one, the story is greater. And it is much more focused. So you'll be playing through, well, first you play through a prologue in uh, the Seventh Citadel. And then after that, you will play through a book. So in Seventh Continent, you played a curse. You just picked a curse, the curse will tell you where to start, and you would wander off. Here's the thing. In Seventh Continent, you could wander anywhere you want. In Seventh Citadel, you can definitely wander anywhere you want, sort of, although the game does have some constraints to keep you from going too far. Uh, they do this with a device um, that you have called the Ground Shiver, and this Ground Shiver uh, has a level. And if your level's low, it's going to be really hard. You're going to spend lots of cards to go off and explore on paths that you're not supposed to be in. This is a deliberate attempt to keep you kind of focused. But you're still going off and exploring. But the way these books work is you'll open the book and it will give you a scenario. And you play through the scenario. You'll get prepped for the scenario. And then you'll go through the epilogue and there will be a conclusion, two different conclusions or maybe three that you do. And then you start another scenario. So this book is just scenario after scenario after scenario, 60 to 90 minutes each, maybe even two hours, depending on how long they could be. While Seventh Continent was just one big giant curse. I guess you could play multiple curses at the same time, but usually just one curse that you're playing. And you might just go the wrong direction and never find it, which, again, may or may not bother you. You might be like, well, I just had fun exploring. And in Seventh Citadel, that exploring's there, but there's a more focused story. Um... The difficulty for both games is about the same. In the original game, Seventh Continent, you were constantly, you have a deck of cards. So this game has a big change where there's not a single deck of cards. Well, there is if you are one player. But if you're playing multiple players, each player has their own deck. And in this, I'm actually going to give the nod to Seventh Continent. The characters in Seventh Continent felt more fleshed out and interesting. For example, and I guess to the, the highest degree, I love playing with Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein, because you could build Frankenstein's monster at some point. The characters in Seventh Citadel feel more generic and mundane. Their decks are different. How they're different, I don't really get it. It's not like there's story in the cards. 
you get a little quest at the beginning of the game, and I haven't got far enough in these games for those quests to pay off, but that gives you something, but the characters' personalities never seem to shine out from that. But you each do have your own deck, and you're not constantly hunting food like you were in Seventh Continent. Seventh Continent, you're always hunting food. Food, 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 food. I need food all the time. In Seventh Citadel, you are going through the deck of cards the same way. The, the checks are, are, are very similar. We'll talk about that in a second. The checks are very similar, but you constantly then will have to take hit points. You take hits to heal these cards up. So you're looking for these cards. that There's cards like a glimmer of hope and things like that that you can spend to give yourself life points back to keep going. And then you can play an easy or hard or whatever it might be. Um, so that's kind of a different thing to it. Some people said to me, now, hey, that means that Seventh Citadel is more apt to be played multiplayer. Yeah, they still both work well as a solo game. I played multiplayer with my kids, but eventually it just really feels like we are playing a solitary game and we're just making decisions together as a group because that's kind of what we did. Yes, we could split up and go in different directions, but if we do that and we go in different directions... You will find that you're better off in a group because the person who goes here probably should have done that with everybody else. And so, yes, there's the idea of splitting up and going across. Um, and so it's probably a little better, but I still think at the end of the day, both of the seventh games work best solitaire. Now, there's a city building element to Seventh Citadel, and this is the other huge change to the game. So the game has a map, and this map, and let's see if I have the map somewhere around here. The map is this huge fold-out map that's essentially a... So it's kind of a neat thing here. This is the map. And there might be cards stuck in the map. I forgot to take all the cards out of this map that show you what you've learned about this map. But this is the map as the land was known. And you can stick cards in here to find out more about the map as you go, as you go around. But as you... As you go around and, and find this map thing, you are exploring and looking at lands, but you're going to constantly keep coming back to the Citadel. And so the game comes with this big paper here. And on this paper, on the Citadel, you're going to find your community and you're going to keep track of your production, defense, knowledge, and influence. You have all these buildings you can build. You have this destiny wheel here, which is very much like a Final Fantasy or uh, you know, role-playing game online where you're checking things off and connecting them based on what you find here. And you can even find some interesting storylines and side quests by going through this. So keeping your Citadel up and figuring out which buildings to build, because when I look at all these buildings, I can, I, I can build the Smithy or I can build the Dispensary or the Santorium or some Gallows, or I can just build a random building and I don't know what that building is exactly. Or I can build the pen or the market. And each one of these has a very different feel to it. So this kind of comes from, I mean, this is definitely a riff on Kingdom Death Monster and or, you know, the other big adventure games where you're then working on something in between because this community that you're building with this sheet becomes a major focus of the game. And what happens as you play through these, these books is you'll go through the story, then you come back and you work on your community and things that are in your community and that will change and test things are going to affect more and you'll learn more as you go through this game and oh because my knowledge in the community is here this lets opens this door to this and so it's kind of like a mini game and I actually like this mini game I liked building up the town a lot I found that to be interesting and it's a nice a nice break or pause between going out on missions here and that's a big thing and gives this game a leg up on the seventh continent luck is evident in both games. In Seventh Continent, the luck could be I chose the wrong direction to go in when I was out exploring the new lands. That's just going to happen. Um, the This game has luck. It has a really discordant luck system. There's card number 13, I think is what it is, and there's six of them, and you draw a card at some major decision points, and it will say you are jinxed or you are fine, you, Lady Luck smiles on you or something like that. And so it's a 50% chance good, 50% chance bad. And the bad's even worse because one of the cards is so bad, it's basically like you're jinxed this turn. And also next turn, you, next time you need to draw these cards, don't bother drawing, just assume you fail. 
Um, I wouldn't mind these per se. I don't like the slight tilt towards the negative and also 50% chance of a bad happening, but they often happen at major story beats and I, we need something major to happen and nope, didn't happen. You failed. I don't know. I didn't find that to be fun. You know, uh, in a, in a video game, I would go reload the save game. We're starting that part over again. Um, the systems themselves, there's a big difference in this game uh, when it comes to doing tests. There's these, these chains that are next to some symbols. So in the original game, just like this game, it will say you need a certain number of successes. And you need to turn over five cards or more, and then you need seven successes. Okay, in the original game, it actually gave you percentages on how many cards to turn over to have at least a 70% chance of success or whatever from the deck. Here you have your own deck that you're drawing from. So you draw all these cards from the deck, but if there's a chain symbol next to it, so let's say it says one plus card, or let's say it says two plus cards, and you need three successes. I'm like, all right, I'll draw six cards. But if there's a chain symbol next to that, that means I, can, I need three successes on two cards. The chain's next to two, I need two cards. Now there are ways to increase the number of cards in this chain, but it makes a lot of tests more difficult. And I found that we failed tests more in Seventh uh, Citadel than we did in Seventh Continent. Now, part of that is because in Seventh Continent, I'd be like, well, I guess we'll just use a lot of cards to solve this problem. Yes, I know that makes the game, we die quicker in the game. And so I guess Seventh Citadel keeps you more on track, but I like the idea of passing tests. There's also symbols on cards that can be changed into successes through different ways. And I think the whole system, which wasn't very simple to begin with, it's a kind of a little complex system in Seventh Continent, is more difficult and more complex than Seventh Citadel. And I don't know that it makes it better. I don't know that the chaining and the symbols and stuff make it better. It just means there's more things to check. And all the different cards that people have in their hands and playing, like every card now can, can be played. They got rid of the combining and forging equipment from the first game, which I know a lot of people like that in Seventh Continent. I thought that was a little convoluted and complex, and I wasn't upset that they got rid of it. But they've made the combat part more difficult to work through. There's also blocking cards where you'll stick, you know, you basically use a card. Uh, weapons that you have can break in this game. You know, you roll a die, and if you roll a certain number, the card goes away. Um, the art is about the same. I think the art for the lands is pretty cool. I think the art for the uh, the people is not that good. So what does it come down to? Like, which one would I recommend? I think for me, so the Seventh Continent is a game that I love when I played. I think I gave it like a perfect 10. It was such an ex incredible experience. Time has dulled that a bit, and I see more of the creaking and the problems with it. And I think I, now I would give Seventh Continent an 8. And I give Seventh Citadel an 8. So which one would I play? I think I would play... The, it's tough because Seventh Continent, there was that wonder. Like, wow, I'm a castaway on an island. Where are we? What's going on? I heard a roar from that cave. What's in that cave? Oh, that sense of exploration and wonder is really cool. Yes, you could wander and find a lot of nothing sometimes. And so they, maybe there would be a nice halfway point between that where you just find more things. Seventh Citadel, you're thrust in a cool, neat fantasy thing. And this prologue is very exciting. The Citadel's collapsing around you and you're just running out, stopping to help or not help people along the way. Um, the story is interesting. There's a lot of it. I think, though, that I would give right now the edge to Seventh Citadel if only because I love this part. I love the building of the city. I think that's interesting. I'm going to play more Seventh Citadel, but I'm going to do it on my own. I'm going to play it solo. I like playing with my kids. It was a great shared experience. But I can play through a lot faster and do stuff. And I'll probably even cheat a little bit along the way. I'm not going to apologize for that, but like, oh, I want to see where this story goes. Why well, this all went badly. Well, let's go see where the story goes anyway, because I'm just curious to see the story. And I've been enjoying myself. I think there's a lot of content in it. You know, there's these, there's two big books, and then there's a, a third one that comes with the expansion, and the expansion adds a lot of stuff. There's just a ton of content in here that I'm going to get to play. So if you like Seventh Continent, I think you will like Seventh Citadel, probably. If you didn't like Seventh Continent, I think Seventh Citadel might fix some of your problems depending on why you didn't like it. If you didn't like it because 
you want more fantastical themes and stuff, you're going to like Seventh Citadel. If you wish there was more things to do, the building up your whole Citadel and community, you're really going to enjoy that. But if the card system and some of the other stuff bothered you, I don't think this game is going to fix it either, Seventh Citadel. So there you go. Uh, for people who have played both of these games, which one do you like best? Let me know in the comments. Anyway, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.